Hello everyone, Big Clinky here, and yes, I have one more video on the X and Y Thought series. Yeah, it's been like a year since I did them, but now that I've completely finished the Looker Quest, I can now express my final thoughts on the whole thing. Now, in case you found this video without either watching my blind run or having played the Looker Quest yourself, I will be openly discussing spoilers here, so please, please, please play it for yourself before watching this video, okay? Right, now, I assume if you're continuing watching this, then you have played it, or at least watched it, so I can give you my thoughts freely. Now, overall, well, I've already said it, the Lure Quest has actually been one of my favourite things about X and Y, like, overall, and because of that, it feels a little disappointing that it was reduced just to a post-game quest. But first, I want to talk about some negatives, because... Nothing is perfect, and I like to get the negatives out of the way first. I have two major gripes with this whole thing. My first, Chapter 1. Pretty much the whole thing. As you could probably tell from my reactions to it, Chapter 1 is very boring and really, really just not that great. And that's a bit of a problem, because when you're doing something like this, you really need to draw the players in. And if you have a bad Chapter 1, they're gonna think, oh, maybe the rest of it's gonna be this bad, and they won't want to keep continuing the quest when it gets a lot better. And immediately, Chapter 2 had me hooked completely. But I just feel like some players might not even get there, because Chapter 1 is just so dull. Really, all you do is just chase down five tickets based on very, very, very easy to follow hints, and there's really no plot developments at all. Looker is basically just, well, apart from him speaking in considerably less broken English, he's pretty much the same as he was before, there's little to no character development to speak of, and really, yeah, there's pretty much no plot, you just go around finding the tickets. now. Maybe they could have at least foreshadowed Emma somehow in this, or made you run into her occasionally a few times, but not fully knowing who she is at that point. That might have better drawn players into her story, maybe. Um, either that or encountering Mimi or something. So, or at least hints at the greater plot that's about to unfold. Because as it stands, you can really remove Chapter 1 from the Looker storyline, and it would not affect anything at all. It explains how the player character becomes Looker's assistant, but, um... That's pretty much it, and to be honest, that's really all that... not really all that necessary. Like, really, Looker could just say, hey, you're my assistant, and that would pretty much fit that bill immediately. So... Yeah, Chapter 1, not the best, and that is probably one of the major weaknesses of this whole thing. And now the second gripe I have doesn't come in until the very end of the Looker Quest. Well, actually, the end of the really main playable portion. And it involves the final battle against Ascentia. Now... At one point, I was almost concerned they would do a t total cop-out and never actually have you fight her at all, but the thing is, they actually did, and I'm really proud of them for that. This is the moment that Emma's entire story has been building up to. The moment that your entire investigation has been building up to you. The climactic final fight of this whole saga. And for the most part, it delivers. You battle her four times in a row, which is pretty insane. And while her teams aren't particularly that strong, I mean, still, the fact that you battle for her four times does make the whole moment really epic. Unfortunately, one thing kind of ruins it. They have this, the battle that the entire arc has been building up to, and they give it the normal trainer battle theme? It might sound really weird to nitpick on this, but I really do believe that music is a very, very vital thing in games. The right music at the right time is really crucial to setting the right mood. And if you're giving the epic final confrontation of your entire storyline the normal, generic trainer music, well that either just shows two things. One, it makes it feel not nearly as epic as it should be, which is bad, and two, it 
possibly indicates the developers, or whoever was just making this part, was just lazy in terms of music choice, and that's even worse. Now, granted, there are a lot of battle themes in this game, and most of them would not really fit Essentia. The gym leader, even the gym leader theme, is a bit too happy sounding. The Team Flare theme, well, she's really not a member of Team Flare exactly, and they wouldn't exactly fit. Really, the only theme that I could really think as actually fitting for this battle would be the Elite Four battle theme. It's appropriately dark and ominous enough, and I guess it actually might kind of work. But the thing is, if they really wanted to make this moment just that much more special, they really should have gone all out and actually made her own unique battle theme. I'm not saying... I hate to, you know, expect too much of developers and criticise things for missed opportunity. I really hate it when reviewers do that. But honestly, this moment really feels like it does need its own battle theme, or at least needs something other than the regular trainer battle theme. Because, ah, uh, I don't know if any of you agree, but it just really felt like a letdown hearing just the normal trainer battle theme for battling against Essentia. It's like, ah, uh, really? It just doesn't... It just feels, again, either lazy or just does not make it feel like an epic final confrontation. And it doesn't make it feel tragic either, so... Anyway, just a bit of a gripe on music choice there. I mean, again, it's not like they didn't make new music just for this arc. You've got the slow, melancholy remix of Lucas theme. You have that incredibly tear-jerking song that uh, plays for Emma. And then you even have Essentia's encounter theme, which is incredibly ominous, and I'm pretty sure you never hear it anywhere else in the entire game. So if they pulled out that many stops to make that much unique music just for this arc, I don't see why they didn't make a unique battle theme for Essentia. But anyway, that's really all I have negative to say about this storyline. So, on to the good, and yes, there was a lot of good in this thing. As I've said, I personally feel that this was one of the best things to come out of X and Y, and I really don't see why people say the post-game of X and Y sucks, because, well, this exists. This has got to be by far one of the best post-game storylines, if not the best post-game storyline ever done in a Pokemon game, and... It doesn't really matter that, admittedly, the actual gameplay portions of it... I mean, okay, the actual tracking down the locations and doing all of that, that was pretty good. I did get lost, admittedly, once, but that's entirely my fault, because I didn't really fully understand one of the hints, and I didn't realise that South Boulevard extended longer than I thought it did. But, really, the hints were never confusing. Other than that, I found everywhere I needed to find immediately on the first try, and it didn't cause any frustration. The actual battles are pretty easy, and yeah, nothing was particularly all that challenging. But I'm okay with that. This was more for story than it was for actual battling. And so it kind of makes sense for the battles to be a bit easy. So, yeah. But in terms of story, this really delivered, and if anything, and this might be somewhat of another negative, but not so much a negative of this itself, if anything, it highlights how lackluster the main story of X and Y was to me. Honestly, none of the characters in the main game were anywhere near as engaging as two characters from this quest, Luca and Emma. Those two characters were better than everyone in the main game combined. And actually, that is sort of sad. This shows that, yep, the writers on, um, on the start of this game really can create interesting, engaging characters and genuinely good storylines. They just, for some reason, decided not to do them for the main story. But... Yeah, enough of on where the main story sort of failed, and more on where this succeeded. And one thing that I thought was really interesting about this was Luca himself. Now, Luca's a bit of an interesting character. He was added to Platinum, who he didn't appear in the original Diamond and Pearl, and he was basically a one-note comic relief character who, personally, I've never really liked all that much. Even, um, 
yeah, considering the fact that he actually became kind of popular, considering that he did appear in the next games in black and white, and even there, he only served to introduce one post-game quest to you and prove that police in the Pokemon world aren't totally useless. But he never really felt like an engaging enough character that I thought, there's a reason he keeps appearing. I thought more, uh, yeah, why does this guy keep showing up? He's not really all that interesting. In this game, though, like, when I first heard there was a Luca subplot in X and Y, I was like, why are they milking this guy again? He wasn't really that interesting the first two times. And somehow they actually finally managed to make him an interesting character in his own right. Luca got some actual character development this time, and he actually proved to be really interesting. You get to see him take on a sort of fatherly role to Emma, you find out that he actually lost a Pokemon on a case in the past, which shows the Pokemon world is actually a lot more violent than most people think it is, and you also get to hear a lot about his actual philosophies and his approach to crime in the fact that you see him dealing with those punks, and he does believe that that no matter how bad, all criminals do have a chance to reform and become decent members of society. And then there's the fact that he would go far enough as to lie about being in hospital and would keep going despite serious injuries just for Emma. You really find out so much more about him in this game than you do in any of his prior appearances. And that actually feels a little bit strange. Like, you find out more about him than in his debut appearance, and I'd probably go as far as to say is, this is the first game where I'd feel Luca as a character really debuts. In early games, he didn't really have much personality, well, not so much personality, but I mean, he didn't really have much to him to speak of, really, but he had actual depth here, which, again, something I never really expected. And then we have Emma, and I'm using her in her Ascentia suit here because, for some weird reason, there actually is no official art of Emma, like, as in, without her suit on. I don't know why. It, that doesn't really seem to make much sense. But, anyway, Emma has got to be one of the best characters to come out of Pokemon since N, and you know what? I actually think she's probably better than N as a character. And that is really saying something. Ah, oh, Ascentia, I mean, Emma slash Ascentia, she really showed me that the Pokemon writers could make good characters again after Black and White, after being sorely disappointed by the main storyline characters of X and Y. There's just so much to her that's just so interesting. And she is, like, flawed realistically. She's flawed to the point where she's still likeable, and... It's kind of interesting that she's one of the few characters who blatantly falls for villain schemes who I can actually still respect because she has a legitimate reason for being so naive about them in that she's grown up on the streets all her life and doesn't really know much about mainstream society. So yeah, she sees an ad for part-time work and she goes for it. She has no idea that uh, they could just be trying to abuse her really. As you go through the quest, you do get pretty attached to her, you learn a lot about her history, and her motivations and the like, and her goals, and you see her as she develops relationships with Luca and eventually Zerosic, which I thought was actually really interesting. Like, on the one hand, you could sort of call it Stockholm Syndrome, but on the other hand, it is fairly clear that she had no idea what Zerosic was doing to her, and... To her, really, he was just another person who sort of showed kindness to her, considering she had no idea what she was really doing because she was effectively in a coma every time that she was forced to commit crimes. And then, yeah, that whole story arc, I guess I should say, the whole expansion suit thing, that was such an amazing concept, and I really would be very disappointed if they did not actually use that in a future game in the series, because that... There was so much potential on that, and so many of those logs that you could read that just explain you s to you so much about how the technology works, and it does some really interesting things, like actually being able to hack into Pokeballs to control Pokemon. I mean, there have been hints on how Pokeballs work and the like. I guess at the very least, this here confirms that 
while it's possible for Pokeballs to kind of brainwash Pokemon into doing whatever their owner wants, that's not the default setting for them. Which does mean that, yeah, uh, Team Plaza wasn't entirely right when they said that Pokeballs were completely mind control devices, and they're completely unethical. Yes, this shows that, yeah, like, Pokeballs can do that, but you have to unauth- um, you have to do an unauthorized hack on them in order to actually have that work, so that's kind of interesting, and it explores the way the technology in the Pokemon world works. And then the fact that, um, that, yeah, Emma is able to use the suit for good afterwards, and it's implied that she'll become some kind of crime fighter on her own, Seriously, there is just so much to that story that really deserves to be expanded on in the future, and it almost feels like they are kind of planning on making some kind of sequel, because seriously, it would be a real waste for them not to continue that plot. The only thing about Emma is, I, I don't know if I probably wasn't the only one who actually wanted Luca to officially adopt her. I don't know, I just felt it, it felt a bit cruel that he had to leave in the end, and I guess that's sort of the point, but... Yeah, that was sort of kind of sad to me. But anyway, that's really all I can say about that. And then we have possibly the most controversial character in the Luka side quest from the kind of things I've read about him now, Dr. Zerosic. One of the Team Flare scientists in the main story, you only really meet him once, battle him once, and then he tricks you into activating the ultimate weapon for science! And then you never see him again. Until this quest, that is, where you find out that Luca's been pursuing him for quite some time. And it's implied by the fact that they, the, the way they talk to each other at the very end, when he says, so I guess you're going by Luca now, implies that maybe these two knew each other at one point before Luca had a code name in the International Police. There's a lot that's a bit unexplored there, and it's quite sort of interesting. But... Yeah, the main thing about Zerosic that uh, a lot of people seem to uh, gripe that some people have that I don't exactly have as much as other people is they felt that his supposed redemption at the end was a little bit unbelievable considering that, well, in the main storyline this is the same guy who wanted to activate an apocalypse causing weapon that would have wiped out most of the world's population for no reason other than FOR SCIENCE! Yeah, some people find it very hard to believe that a character like that is actually redeemable. And honestly, personally where I fall on this, the Zerosic that you see purely in the Luka side quest, he does feel somewhat believably redeemable. And the thing is, I don't believe it's a full-on, oh I'm suddenly good now, yay thing. It's more that he acknowledges the crimes he's committed, he acknowledges he's done a bad thing and that he's gone too far, and he willingly turns himself in, but he makes no attempt to avoid punishment for his crimes. And this, to me, is actually a bit different than immediately turning good. This is more like, yeah, a villainous character who realises they've been villainous, but also realises they do deserve to be brought to justice for their actions. So it's not like they're getting off completely scot-free without any punishment or anything. Speaking of which, it looks like Malva's actually getting off completely scot-free for what she did, because it's implied that Luca's giving her a plea bargain in exchange for information. But, uh, I think I already discussed Malva in my Elite Four analysis, well, in my, uh, character analysis video, so I'm not exactly going to talk about her that much here, but she is very interesting, I'll just say. Most of the stuff that I've said about her I already said in the actual videos themselves. But, yeah, Zerosic, I don't really think people should be all that angry about this kind of thing, because it's not so much the game completely forgiving him, and it's not the characters completely forgiving him. It's more that, yeah, he... he does feel some remorse for his actions, but also realises just how bad they were. And what I was saying in the first place is, the Zerosic you see in the Looker Quest, if you just count that version of him, then you can believe all this. It's more that this doesn't really add up with what we see of him in the main story, and to me, this is less of a problem with the Looker Quest and more highlighting a problem with the main storyline. It almost feels like the Zerosic in the main game and the Zerosic from the post game are two entirely separate characters for the most part. The only thing they really share in common is their obsession with science. Other than that, the Zerosic in the main game, I kind of understand why people would consider him totally irredeemable. He basically makes you, um, 
essentially, potentially makes you uh, like culpable for activating the Ultima weapon, and he really sees no qualms about that at all, and the real issue that I have here is, the game doesn't do a very good job of explaining what his reasons are for doing this. Why does he want to activate the ultimate weapon for science? It's never really explained, and again, really I feel this is more a failing of the main story than something you can blame on the post-game story. Zerosic really feels like the kind of character who should have got more exposure in the main game. He was played up in a lot of trailers, and it really seemed like he was going to be the leader of Team Flare by what we all saw. And yet he only appeared in one battle and one cutscene and then was never seen or heard of again, which felt really, yeah, a bit strange. Now, there's one way that I really... Okay, I, here's something about me. It is a massive pet peeve of mine when people suggest ways they could fix canon. I don't believe in fixing canon because I believe that personally that it is arrogant to assume that you could do better than the creators of a work you're a fan of. It's part of why I tend to dislike fanfiction so much. But something that I actually am thinking of here... Perhaps... A way to give Zerosic a bit more exposure in the main storyline, and maybe to make some more interesting admins, is... Replace all of the Team Flare scientists with Essentia. Have Essentia work into the main story somehow, and that way it gives Zerosic more of a role in the main story as well. And, yeah, you'd be seeing Essentia throughout the main story, and she could be a recurring admin that you fight instead of the Team Flare scientists. Now, the thing with me is that, to me, I always found the Team Flare scientists completely and utterly forgettable in every single way. I can barely even remember their names. They are that forgettable to me. Honestly, you could replace all of their appearances with Essentia, and I don't think the story would change very much. The Team Flare scientists were never really fleshed out characters in their own right. They barely had any personality to speak of, and they were not very challenging in battle. Their teams were very, very minimal and pretty easy. So, yeah, Zerosic was really the only scientist who was actually somewhat interesting, and maybe if they give it him and Essentia more of a role maybe in the main story. Now, I don't know what that means. If maybe you actually fight Essentia a lot during the main story, and it's only in the post-game who you realise, um, where you realise who she actually is. But... Or have you meet Emma in Lumio City and integrate that into the main story somehow? I don't know, but... The interesting thing is, the Pokemon Adventures manga actually seems to be doing this. In the manga, Essentia is actually fought alongside Team Flare during the main during the manga's adaptation of the main story plot. And yeah, maybe that would have worked better in the games, I don't know. Back to the whole Zerosic plot, one thing that I found very interesting plot-wise is that they kind of subverted the whole cliché of someone, you know, we all love has been brainwashed. Hey, let's all just say encouraging things. You can do it, and eventually her mind will snap out of it on her own through the power of friendship. They actually subverted that in the fact that that sort of works, but not quite. And in fact, it seems to be making things worse. But what ends up actually happening is, your messages, while they don't get through to Emma herself, they do get through to the one who's actually operating her, and he's the one who, seeing this, realises that he's gone too far and deactivates the mind control himself. That was actually really interesting, and I actually don't think I've seen that in a lot of mind-controlled friend plots that I've... And believe me, the mind-controlled friend plot is something that happens a lot, and I've seen an awful lot in my time. So it was kind of interesting to see it twisted like that. One more thing with Zerosic I guess I'll mention here. There are some people who've said that the fact that he has a Crobat, which is a Pokémon that evolves through happiness, foreshadows the fact that he's not completely irredeemable. And I guess that sort of makes sense considering that Maxi and Archie also had Crobats, and they were some of the more, well at least, um, they're to this date the only evil team leaders who actually show remorse for their actions, and kind of like Zerosic did. The part where this analogy kind of starts to lose it, though, is Cyrus had a Crobat. And, well, Cyrus really doesn't show any signs of being redeemable at all, so 
that kind of feels a little bit weird. Not to mention that the Crobat is apparently completely contrary to his philosophy entirely, and it really almost makes no sense for him to actually have a Pokémon that evolves through happiness, so... That is where it kind of falls apart a little bit, but I do see what they were going for. I do love the fact that he has a Malamar, and that the fact that that foreshadows his involvement in a mind control plot. That was really interesting, so uh, yeah, that's, that's one cool thing about his team at least. So, yeah, overall, those would be my thoughts on the whole Looker, Looker plot, and yeah, overall they're very, very positive. I still feel this is one of the best storylines to come out of Pokemon lately, and it just feels so weird they'd save it for a post-game plot when the main plot was really, really underwhelming in terms of story. It does feel a bit weird, like the fact that I actually enjoyed this so much more than I enjoyed the main story. It, yeah, there's just something a little wrong about that, but that's not to say that, yeah, this is still a very good plot and we should appreciate that. So I've already gone on for long enough, I guess, so that's basically it. And that probably is it for my X and Y um, thoughts and opinions video series. Um, so I've, yeah, given definitely a lot of um, consideration to it, and yeah, I have a lot to say about this game. Unfortunately, most of it's not entirely positive, but, um, but anyway, I guess that'll be it. So this is Big Clingy, and I guess I'll see you all next time.